Good. Okay. So Ben. <laughs> Professor. Nice. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, this is actually for those of those of you who are watching, which I'm sure are a myriad of millions. Um, this is like the first time I've met Ben. And um, it's a real pleasure, Ben, really. Absolutely. Um, I actually first heard your name from guitar player Camilo Valendia, who's a good friend of mine. Yeah. I, I know of his playing. I don't think we've met in person, but he's great. I'll tell you one thing. Camilo is a hilarious guy. I'm sure he's sure he's watching this right now, and he was and he's like, "Yeah, you always say that." He's a hilarious guy. I, I wish he would do funny videos, but you know his playing is so great. There's no time for the funny. I <laughs> sure. Fair enough. <laughs> so I want to just dive right into who you are and how you got to where you are. I I just think that that's um a really fascinating thing that a lot of people are very interested in. So we're going to just, uh, just tell, where are you from, first of all? Absolutely, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, and um, grew up there, uh, lived there until I was 21, and, uh, well, thereabouts, I think. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then, um, yeah. Before the law started after you, right? That's, uh, that sounds right, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> no, that's... I grew up in Australia and it's, it was great and that shaped a lot of my early musical life, of course, you know, being there. Okay, so now you know that people are going to first, especially right now, right now people are going to think, Ben's from there, Josh Meter's from there. A, they must know each other. A lot of people have said that and I, I don't really know Josh, but he's fantastic. I found out about him through the internet, as uh, so many of us have, yep. and... Um, what a fantastic guitar player, you know. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I, it's brilliant just sort of, uh, you know, uh, Lainey Stern once said to me, how is it that all these guitar players come out of Australia, you know? And so she said, it must be the water. It must be because you're surrounded by water and you have this fluidity. And I, I thought that was, that was really cool that she said that. So maybe are she's you sure it's Are you sure it's not like the wild, the dangerous wildlife? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you're always running into the practice room to anyways. Um, so now you obviously um, I, I, I can't remember where I heard this from, but I do know that you had music tuition, music instruction as a very young child. I did. Yes, that's right. I did when I was four years old. Um, my older brother was in piano lessons and, you know, at that age, you sort of want to do whatever your brother does, you know, so I thought, I, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so my parents put me into these sort of Yamaha group keyboard lessons where they teach you to oh. play hot cross buns, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. you know, that was the beginning for me. But I sort of am very grateful for that in retrospect because it was... Um, I didn't know it at the time, but it developed my ear in a way that I still use today. You know, I sort of had an aversion to learning how to read music because I had a lot of trouble with it when I was very little. Mm. So they had these little cassette tapes back in the 90s, you know. I've <laughs> heard of those, actually. Remember those? And, yeah, uh, so somehow you, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, learn the, you'd learn the song off the cassette tape, or at least I would sort of learn it by ear. Right. And uh, when I was very little and purely out of a sort of not wanting to or not being able to read music. So I think that actually set me up well for the future in a strange way. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? You're not the only person with that particular affliction. Oh, really? I have, <laughs> yes. I knew this pianist who had this, who did the same thing or yeah, who did the same thing. And what they did was they faked like they were reading and they did that for many years and it, it took, you know, the teacher copped on eventually. And then, mm. boom, they realized that this particular pianist could play anything he heard. Oh. So, you know, so he heard whatever and he played it. Henceforth, he developed perfect pitch. Yes. which I'm, And I think that's your story too, right? It, it is my story too. I do have perfect pitch, which right. um, has helped me a lot. Um, it's not required. So many great musicians don't have perfect pitch, but um, but for me personally, I I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine. You know, there was um, 
There's actually a guitarist here. He was a very, very well-known, dare I say, famous guitarist named Dan Warner, may mm -hmm. he rest in peace, who died died suddenly. He was um, a relatively young guy, session player here in Miami, mm -hmm. who had perfect pitch okay. and was very, very fast. As you can imagine, he would hear the song down once and he would he would know all the changes mm. um, and it made him very fast, which of course made him very valuable. Um, I bet. Of, there were other attributes, of course, um, you know, that Dan had, but perfect pitch was one of them. And um, uh, I always tell this story that I asked Michael Brecker if he had perfect pitch and he was like, no, do you? And I was like, Mike, it's OK. You know, I, I was just asking a question. So so obviously there are many, many great players who don't have it. Yeah, I'm curious. And I'm sure there are. um uh people who are watching now who some people like really have this uh chip on their shoulder about those who have perfect pitch yep. and um i'm curious as to how you use it mm -hmm. and what it's done for you yeah well let me give you an example i'll give you a couple of examples actually but um perfect i did an album it came out last year and it was called Ace and it was sort of a collaborative trio record. And the reason I mention this is not so much for shameless self-promotion, but more so because the very first track um, starts off with a sort of rubato section where we're reiterating this certain theme. And then from there on, when the drums come in, it's basically free improvisation and the direction that I sort of gave the two other guys in the band, the drummer and the bass player, um, was, okay, well, the drummer sets up a tempo and uh, the bass player, you pick the tonality, you pick the key um, and I'm going to follow you guys and then I'm going to play this, uh, this motive, this theme rather, again and that'll, then I want you guys to pick another key and another tempo and we've all got to land in the same place. So in an improvisational situation like that, perfect pitch is really handy because it, it enables me to sort of improvise on this level of not even knowing what key we're going to, um, I've got to work it out in that moment. And especially um, playing improvised music and being in certain bands where there might be, for example, a free improvised section of a piece of music, or even just hearing superimposed tonalities over the top of a pre-existing set of changes, um, Perfect Pitch has helped me a lot in that way as well, you know. And also in terms of transcribing. I've, I've transcribed a lot of stuff in my, in my life, and I still do, not as much as I used to, but um, I can do stuff, I can do it really quick as a result. Without your instrument? Without my instrument. A lot of my transcription is not done with the instrument. Oh, man. A lot of people would love to be able to do that. Yeah, well, I, I know, I know. But, but <laughs> you know, so, so many of my heroes and also great mentors that I've been lucky to have in my life don't have perfect pitch. And it's, you know, uh, some people have it, some don't, but if, you know, is what it is. Oh, so when you're, okay, so you've talked about free playing, um, which actually is something I've done a lot of. Um, yeah. And let's talk about non-traditional harmony where the changes are moving quickly. Mm. Now, how does perfect pitch play into that? Because I think that there are, there, there might be those students um, and those players, those pro players that might be watching this as well, that think that it somehow is, I don't, I don't want to say the key, no pun intended, but I mean, just like the answer, like if you just have perfect pitch and if there are all those changes happening, you'll still be able to shred through them. I would, I'd probably, I'd probably disagree with that. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, perfect pitch is a great, uh, it's a great asset. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know anything other than having it. So that's, that's my reference point, but there is no substitute for hard work and, um, and working out how to work your way through changes and, and knowing your materials, um, spending many, many hours with the instrument, you know, I mean, being able to sort of cognitively process 
what a what a note is or a, what key you're in in real time that's great but it's sort of for me it's very clear cut if you want to get good at playing through changes on the guitar then practice exactly that practice playing through changes on the guitar you know perfect pitch helps me guide the lines through the changes but i still have to do the groundwork you know right so when you were doing the groundwork and you were learning how to voice lead you were still having to learn third goes to the seventh yeah. of the card you're in seventh yeah. goes to the card of the third of the cards you're going to like you had to work all of that stuff out right i sure did yeah and it took a long time and i got very frustrated as we probably all do but i sort of wasn't going to be beaten by it i was just persistent you know there you go okay so there you have it folks <laughs> <laughs> just sheer... now we can we can we can put this baby to rest <laughs> it's just sheer bloody mindedness i just wouldn't be stopped there you go <laughs> Okay, well, speaking of getting stopped, um, did you go to conservatory? I did. I went to New England Conservatory in Boston, and that was a real privilege, I must say, to get to go there. I um, was fortunate to get a scholarship that enabled me to go there in the first place. And um, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I was quite young when I went there, I suppose, in the grand scheme of things. And, and the deal was with my parents at the time, you know, well, if you get a scholarship, you can go. <laughs> so, so Listen, these days you have to get a scholarship. Yeah, well, that was, um, yeah, that, I understand. Yeah. Refer to my video, folks, on should you go to music school, where I do a, a it's a very in-depth study on should you go and a price comparison. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Especially in Boston. Sure, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I it was, it was a, hot topic of conversation you know this is 10 years ago now it was a hot topic of conversation amongst all of my peers uh, and friends close friends and peers you know who were also going to school in boston at the time uh, it was hard to keep afloat um but you know you, you make it happen <laughs> when there's a yeah. will there's a way but um but nonetheless not to focus on that aspect too much i got to study with with heroes of mine uh Donnie McCaslin, Jerry Bagonzi, um, oh, great guitarist Brad Shepik, who I had listened to for years and was so happy to meet and get to study with. He was in my audition, actually, at the time. And, um, of course, the great pianist Jason Moran, who opened my mind to a lot of other stuff, too. And I'd, I had seen Jason play with Wayne Shorter in Melbourne when I was 15. And uh, to sort of uh, six or seven years later be... Uh, learning with him one-on-one -on -one in Boston. I mean, you know, how good is that? That's, a, that's a Well, incredible. you just, it's incredible. And you just said something that pings another thing here, and that is you are 15 and you're going to see improvised music yeah. live. Sure. Yeah. That's a big deal. I, yeah, I, I didn't know much different at the time. I was, um, I was very fortunate to, to have access to my parents' record collection from when I was really young and um, consequently was introduced to Pat Metheny and Weather Report and Steely Dan and all these things and George Benson and so many other people whose names I'm, you know, we'd be here all day if I went through everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's just what caught my ear, you know, and when I was about 10 years old and that grew into sort of uh, really wanting to be involved in jazz and improvised music you know so unlike um like myself i was a late bloomer mm -hmm. and um i mean i tried to do something else i went to believe it or not harley davidson mechanic school that's pretty cool <laughs> and, wow really <laughs> yes i did it was um yeah so i did i did something that was um not musical and it was a struggle when I went to, well, when I went to University of Miami at that particular vintage, it was the best school in the world. There was, um, I mean, I don't know how to say this except that everybody seemed to be at a professional level when I got there. And I thought, I'm never going to get into any ensemble. So that was my experience going to school. I noticed that there is this. There is this reoccurring team with yourself, with Josh, and with many, many other players who are of a certain age and of a certain level of accomplishment. You've been exposed to this language um, and this, um, 
how do you say this particular vernacular at a mm. very young age mm. and it does make a difference does that mean that you can't get good you know if you start late of course it doesn't um but there is something i mean you are a known player and um a burgeoning modern jazz guitarist of modern <laughs> tendencies and and you know you uh you you have had a very similar path as a lot of guitarists that a lot of people are idolizing and looking up to, which is, I find, very interesting. Now, your major in school, I imagine, was performance or was it not? It was jazz performance, yep. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a really weird question. Go ahead. Where did it all go wrong for you? <laughs> wrong in what sense? It could be... Do you just mean in sort of a general existential sense or just the first point at which I realized that not as not all is well. Yeah, not as not all is well. When did you hit a wall? Oh, when did you hit? In a few on a few levels. I mean, I hit a wall in Boston. Oh. I had had to make it work, and I think it's it's irresponsible of people to not to pretend like money is not a thing in the modern music world. You know, I I never yeah. was in uh, you know terrible terrible dire straits, but there were some some tough times. You know, that's life. Yeah. Um, now, what was I going to say? Um, what about, acad not academically, but what about in your pursuit? Like we talked about, okay, so you, the, the perfect pitch thing, you were exposed to music as a, as a young child, this improvised music. But when was it hired for you? Oh, right. Well, there's another level on which we could discuss this. You know, I think that it was difficult for me. Um, I think for somehow I had sort of a natural uh, sort of ability um, with the guitar on some level, I, it, it came to me seemingly naturally, you know, to some degree, I guess. But mm -hmm. um, I also had to push. I had to keep pushing in terms of technical ability. And uh, I think we all get to a point where we think we're playing really good and then something comes and knocks you down. And then you think, wow, I possibly became a little arrogant momentarily and this is what I needed in fact to keep me going and um, I think there's a series of those experiences in life you know I think it's uh, <laughs> you know it, or in life as a musician and a creative individual you know definitely when I was about 15 and I, I sort of got with my first proper jazz guitar teacher one-on-one -on -one, um, his name was Peter Petrucci and we're still friends to this day, you know, uh, and mm -hmm. Peter's a great guitarist in Australia. And he um, could see that I had, you know, I had learned a lot of stuff that I guess a lot of other 15 year olds at that point did not uh, know in terms of jazz. But I think he could also see that I needed, needed a push. So he took me to task uh, in a sort of constructive way to give me the, a push in the right direction for what, what I needed in order to develop more. And that was the first memorable moment where I sort of, you know, I was, was taken to task on not knowing certain things as well as I should have. And I really have to give great credit to Peter in that moment because, you know, that's, I'll always remember it. It was important. And so when did it all start going right for you? <laughs> I don't know. You want to talk again in 10 years? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I'm just joking. Uh, yes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, look, I've, uh, I've had a wonderful life um, playing music in New York. It's, it's been the, the, the life of my dreams. You know, I've gotten to play in musical situations that I, I dreamt of, um, you know, that came true. I'll give you an example. The first week I arrived in Boston... I um, went to, oh, gosh, what was the venue? It's, uh, I'm blanking right now. But I went to see uh, the band Terry Lynn Carrington's Mosaic Project. And I remember being so blown away by this band. I had heard the record um, of hers, Mosaic uh, Project album at the time. And I went to go and see the band. And I was so blown away by this band. I thought, that, that is the band that I want to play with. That, that's it, you know, if, if I get to play with 
for example, this band, that is something that I would absolutely love. And um, Terry is someone who I'd, I'd heard her play on John Schofield albums. I'd heard her play, obviously, with Herbie Hancock and in so many situations uh, as a listener. Um, so that was uh, right when I got to Boston. Then four years later, I end up on a recording session in New York. And who happens to be on this recording session? Terry Lynn Carrington. And fortuitously, from that meeting, she began calling me um, to play with that very same band. Mm. Um, and, you know, within a, a month or so of having met her on a recording session, uh, I was um, off playing in Turkey and the UK and uh, Iceland mm. and all over the States. You know, I, I mean, look, that was a life-changing experience and it made me a better musician and a better person. That's incredible. It, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty cool, I must say. So you, so you did that and I imagine that, um, that set you up in some way to be able to start making a living in New York. That's the first time that happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I, it certainly made things, uh, more viable to stay in New York because look, from the decade that, that has just ended, um, probably right up to now because there has been a bit of an you know economic crisis. Of course, um, the cost of living cost of living in New York right up to probably 2019 was sort of going steadily up, up and up yes. and up. And again, you know, I think it would be sort of remiss of me to not at least touch upon that a little bit because it is a real thing for. Uh, I guess, my generation and younger of musicians to be faced with. So are you saying that you couldn't afford your loft in Tribeca? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Uh, look, it was just... Because I, I couldn't afford mine there, so don't feel bad. Don't oh, feel bad. <laughs> no, no worries, no. I, I never, never quite had a loft. But, um, but on that topic, I, I, what was so funny, before I moved to New York, I talked to Jerry Bagonzi, who was someone I studied with probably more than anyone in Boston and Jerry told me about when he lived in New York in the 70s and he paid under a hundred dollars rent a month for yeah. his loft in uh, the Lower East Side I think he I think it was and um, and he said yeah you know my 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 neighbor upstairs liked saxophones so I just I just played <laughs> it wasn't a problem yeah, that's... Um, but anyway I... no look what, the reason I mentioned that at all is because it's just a uh, there probably is a correlation between getting more work and having an easier time in, in what is quite frankly an expensive city, you know? Yes. So, um, I, I'm going to jump to that and then I'm going to jump a little bit around and you can give short answers to this. Um, and that's, that's ground too. Mm. Um, so a lot of people think I got to move to New York. If I make a living in New York, I'll be, I'll be fine. I'll, I'll kind of like, you know, I'll have the stripes on my unit, my jazz uniform. Yes. And um, uh, and then they find out that they they are playing casuals, and they're not doing jazz gigs. Yep. Um, do you find um, that for yourself that you're you're before the COVID thing happened that you were playing mostly live music, or were you teach were you teaching students? Um, were you adjuncting in colleges? Um, Oh, I did. I did a bit of all of that. Um, yeah, I was um, getting to play on a lot of recordings, which um, is work that sort of, especially toward the end of, I guess you'd say the 2010s, was really wrapping up. Uh, it was not. It was becoming certainly less viable to make good money out of that. And certainly, by no means am I calling myself a studio musician or anything like that. I think the, the glory days of that are, have passed. Um, but I did get to do studio work on straight ahead jazz albums and that paid reasonably well. I did pop recording sessions for BMG records. I did a bunch of that kind of work and that paid great. Uh, mm -hmm. That was always good. Um, certainly I had to be versatile or have had to be versatile, I should say. It's not over. It's just mm -hmm. been a different kind of year, as you know. But... Um, but nonetheless, you know, I, I have had to, I had have had to be versatile and um, sort of draw upon my knowledge of various stylistic 
elements of guitar playing. You know. And um uh which leads me to this. A lot of people who follow you um uh they really love the way you play. They really love, of course, you're going to you're expecting this, but the aesthetic of playing fast and playing with a lot of technique. I like to do it too. I didn't arrive at my technique <laughs> nearly as early as you did. It was a, a recent transition for me. Um, and of course, as you know, there is no substitute for push-ups. That's right? true. That's there's true. no substitute for that. But people love the way you play. And they, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but they love your ability to technically destroy the guitar. No. <laughs> that if for anybody who has actually done it like there's the people who wish they've done it and then there's the people who are actually doing it there's no substitute for ours i had a good friend of mine say you can teach a monkey to play fast so we know that if you put enough pressure you know into that proverbial piece of charcoal you will get that diamond technique yeah. oh, great metaphor um how do you how did you do it how did you um how do you maintain it mm -hmm. um and then how many hours does all that take <laughs> that's that's a good question and i think that the the one thing i will say very quickly is that i i i have indeed become known for i've become known for someone who has uh i guess a certain degree of technique developed on the instrument and um, I've certainly received recognition for that, and I'm I'm grateful to have anyone who's willing to listen, you know. But uh, the thing that the thing I will say very quickly, and I will answer your question, is that the, I guess the um, the thing that causes all the technique-related material in my playing to make any kind of sense is that it's balanced out with melodic ideas and uh, moments where the music can breathe and. And uh, certainly I have um, gotten some interesting responses at time on social media saying, oh, this guy just plays the same fast stuff over and over again, yeah. Um, well, sometimes a 26-second video or however long video is uh, not necessarily the same. It's not necessarily a full picture of someone's playing. You know, sometimes if a person has recorded material, an album, an EP, played on someone else's record, maybe that's the best place to to hear the, the full picture of their playing. So, uh, not if they're going to comment on social media, <laughs> <laughs> they only have to hear the 20 second thing. Uh, they only, I know exactly, <laughs> exactly. But just as a side point, but anyway, yeah, of uh, course. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what I was going to say was, uh, you know, look, I, um, when I was probably, when I was a teenager, 17 or 18, look, I mean, I'm <laughs> quite frankly, the, the sun in Australia is very bright. So I, I could, what was I playing outside? Was I going to the beach? No, I, I get burnt mm. in 15 minutes. So yes. look, uh, I spent most of my time. <laughs> Me in, too. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, you know, spend most of my time indoors practicing and I would practice up to 10 hours a day sometimes, um, usually between six and 10 hours a day. Now that is a probably staggering number of hours on some level, but as long as it's structured, it has to be structured. I'm, I'm less concerned with the amount of hours um, than I am with the content of your practice. And Wait a second. Are you telling me that you're a structured person? <laughs> I, t I try. I try. Oh, no. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Josh. Do you, how, is your room messy or is your room clean? It's, it's clean most of the time. I knew it. Yeah. I it, knew it. <laughs> it has to so be. I, I can't think otherwise. This is all like fake. This is green screen right here. <laughs> all fake. Yeah, behind this is a disaster. <laughs> just off camera. <laughs> yeah, just way off camera. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I have no pants on and oh. all that stuff. But, uh, but it helps the interview flow. Um, so, the, so, you're, so you're a very structured guy and you put a lot of time into doing that so it does it does it take a lot of hours right now to maintain that technical level you know i practice realistically four hours a day these days mm -hmm. um which is uh the reason i say realistically is because i do need to get new ideas and things into my playing 
I do need to maintain a sort of l certain level of technical ability just for myself, you know, just for, to feel good about playing. I think it's really important for you to feel good about your own playing. And um, I, some days are better than others. I think we're all in the same boat with that. But um, I... Sorry, no, go ahead. No, no, go on, go on, go on. Sorry. <laughs> I oh, realize no, we're taking a breath. <laughs> oh, no, I was just thinking for a moment. I, I Yeah, look, I um, some days are better than others, but, you know, I also have to sort of maintain my life in this social media world that we live in. You know, it's sort of, uh, I don't think it's enough to lament the fact that it's not 1975 anymore. You know, Arista Records is not coming to knock on your door with a record deal for the next instrumental hit LP. <clears throat> It's just not going to happen. Um, it's a different world we live in. So I have to manage a lot of stuff myself. And um, uh, I enjoy that, mind you. You know, I, I think it's great. But it's just a, that's part of my life too. Yeah. Well, there's something about your... I'm back to your technique. There's something about your technique that reminds me of the... I, I might be wrong, the REH... Um, uh, Schofield first Schofield um, oh. tutorial video. Incredible. There's something about right and um, and you know Schofield actually. This is my beef with him is that he never really wanted to give you everything he was doing in his instructional videos, as opposed to Scott Henderson, who was like, "Here's everything I have." Um, I'm sure John Schofield would um would, might disagree with me, but there was that I noticed that in the videos, but in the video he did talk about how he did his legato playing which is how i used to do mine i sort of kind of still do when i do it um i'm an, an economy picker and legato player but um something about your playing reminds me of that old video technically i'm not saying that you're playing out of that that vocabulary um although let's face it john is the trunk you know we all all of us modern players, we come yeah. from that to, oh. a certain, to a certain degree. So is there something that you saw? Did you, well, first of all, did you see that video? Second of all, did you model any of what you're doing from his stuff? Oh, uh, yes and yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I did see that video. You know, I got it on, um, I had it on, uh, someone gave me a VHS copy when I was about 16. And... Um, you know, people still had VHS players in their homes. Then I don't yeah. know if they do now. I don't, but uh, no, you know, I, I don't either. It's a, it's probably. I think it's on YouTube anyway. This current, this particular video, and um, I, I just always liked it. It had a certain DIY appeal to me. It's sort of he lights up a cigarette and um, yeah, talk, talks about his stuff and and uh, just plays that AS two hundred with a clean sound, and you can hear everything. And uh, it says a lot of really cool stuff. Um, as I've gotten it, older, I don't, I don't use all of it. I've adapted some of it for my own type of playing. But especially that era of Schofield's playing for me was huge. Everything from yes. Rough House, Who's Who, uh, Shinola, um, up to, you know, uh, you know, all that stuff through the mid-80s, the Grammar Vision records. That was... Um, basically from 77 up to 89 those were the records that i listened to of his a lot let's not forget the live one oh, with uh, uh, richie byrack oh of course yes good point that, that with is softly a, as it with softly as in a morning sunrise oh my god that solo that Jesus. is such such an underrated album such an underrated yes. i love that incredible playing and um he sort of as i understand was not particularly well known at that point but oh jesus i mean thank god oh, wait a second my friend got that album as a cutout oh really they called them cutouts so it was like a a three dollar record or something like that <laughs> at the used record so i remember that it had the the slice in it that oh they yeah. had for those promo records yeah i just i love i'm glad it was recorded you know it's such a such a, a phenomenal playing there was nothing like it at the time so everybody who's watching, Ben and I are telling you to go check out that John Schofield tutorial record and, of course, that the live record as well. Now, um, uh, one last thing on your technique. Um, how do you get it to... If somebody is um, working through your material, which, by the way, you should go, go check out Ben's website, 
Um, so you can check out all of his PDFs and you should buy them, study them and try to get them up to tempo. Um, uh, I was going to say as a selfless plug, I, I, if you look, I'll put below this video, you can get the Vidami um, YouTube slow down pedal which is amazing because you can keep your hands on your guitar and figure out all of Ben's stuff, right? Because you can slow Ben down. Yeah, sure. And, um, and, and uh, trust me, it's hard to slow Ben down. <laughs> and uh, how do you, um, how do you p get it to go that fast? Like when you say, okay, everybody, now we're going to do 30 second notes. How can a student go from zero to hero and get it to be 30 second notes like you're doing? Um, do you know, I, I say this to, um, I say this to anyone I've gotten to uh, teach workshops uh, at universities and, um, uh, I can't stress enough that start slow, start as slow as you need. It's a meditative process for me. I always start every day with just uh, quarter notes at 90 beats per minute, arpeggios. Uh, it's it's not about fast. It's about the musical statement. It's about getting to the musical destination, and that means go as slow as you need to, and then find your fastest tempo that you can get to, and then push it 10 beats per minute, 10 BPMs faster than your most comfortable tempo. Never hurt yourself. Never be in pain. That's not good. And this is not weightlifting. This is music. You know, this is uh, find your most comfortable tempo and then push it 10 BPM faster than that. And then do that for a few days. And then that will be your, then that will be your next most comfortable tempo. And then do the same thing. You know, let's say you can get my lines up to 200 BPM or whatever, you know, just for example. And you're comfortable with that. Push it up to 210 and then get comfortable with that. Once that happens, push it up to 220 and so forth. And there's no shame in starting as slow as you need. You know, when I was a teenager, I would start as slow every day as quarter notes at 60 BPM because I had tendonitis as a teenager and I had to. Mm. And uh, that's my permanent reminder, the, the burning in my forearm, which I'll never forget, which I thankfully haven't had in 15 years or so. Um, that's a good reason to start slow too. <laughs> You know what you should have? You should have the Ben Yunsen, um line challenge. Maybe I should, yeah. <laughs> you should do that where, where people have to get the line up to tempo. Maybe um, I should. I don't know. I'm just, yeah, I think it would be a great idea. I think it would be a great idea. That is a and great idea. And then sell idea. that PDF. Sell I the will... PDF of the line. <laughs> they, you... they could choose from five lines and... Right? right, that is, right. A, that is an excellent idea. I, I, it is very likely I'll do that probably within the next week. <laughs> so. Oh, I can't wait! I can't wait. Okay, so I'm going to um, uh, uh, mention some things about gear and, in let's say, a couple words, answer. Okay, gear, yes. So, um, gear will also cover um, picks and strings. So, string gauge, a uh, string gauge tens. Tens. Okay, I won't tell you I use eights. That's um, that's fine. <laughs> no worries. Um, amp live amplifier. Uh, live amplifier. I have um, two amps that were custom built for me by uh, Michael Perez Cisneros, who's a great recording engineer in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and uh, he custom built two amps for me that he had built. For his studio, Big Orange Sheep in Brooklyn, which is the studio I use for everything. I love it. And um, he custom built these two amps off, uh, based off two Fender 5E3 kind of tweed amps. And, um, but they don't get too dirty, you know, they don't, um, they just get dirty enough, but you can also get them clean. And I run two of them. And um, your top, sometimes... oh, I'm sorry. sorry no, 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 sorry, that's, sorry. It. Well, that's it. Yeah. No, I was going to say your top three pedals that you can't gig without. Can't gig without. Well, first would be a uh, a tuner. Got to be in tune. You know, got to be. A... <laughs> okay, so you can make it four pedals now. <laughs> okay, sure, no worries. I have yeah. a, a, a Dunlop mini volume pedal, which I just love. It's great. Uh, I have a, this drive called the Tech Twenty One Oxford, which um, 
is sort of just it's just fattens up the tone if I want to drive but it's a very sort of natural sounding drive it doesn't sound like oh he's got distortion on you know it just sort of uh, I think of it as a, a way to expand my dynamic range that's all you know uh, next one would probably be uh, gosh I'm trying to think now I've gone blank uh, now, here's one that I don't use very often, but it's great to have, and that is the uh, Exotic SP Compressor. Um, mm. Don't use it all the time, but when it comes time to use, uh, if I'm on a recording and I need to use a bit of compression, that is a life-saving moment to have it, um, just in case. And so there's no delay or, or reverb pedals? Well, good question. I'm sort of, uh, I'm trying out a bunch of new delays, um, I'm sort of working it all out with that. Certainly, if I'm playing on a record, we add delay later. Um, it, I never record with delay on. Not, not recently, anyway. Not within the last few years. Um, but I, uh, I did for some time use the, uh, the Keeley Delay Workstation. That is a great pedal. And mm, um, okay. that was my go-to pedal for a number of years. Uh, There's nothing wrong with it. I just want to try some other stuff. But it's, it's great. Okay, um, another thing is, I'm, somebody, some people might be interested in this, you wear your guitar pretty high. I do, I do indeed. Why? Uh, you know, I, I remember when I was sort of like 10 years old and I was curious about like late 70s punk bands and like the, <laughs> the jam, Paul Weller, you know, I'd see him with like a, like a Rickenbacker slung really low, I was like, yeah, that's cool, you know. Uh, and then I'd see guys with the guitar up here, and I'd think that's lame, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the logic yeah. of a logic of a ten-year-old. Uh, no, that, that's that... Los Angeles logic, actually. <laughs> 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 well, there you go. I <laughs> that yeah. that was my logic. <laughs> Look, I I yeah. got into I got into jazz, and I I love Pat Metheny, and I I I saw um I, I love George Benson and. All these great guitarists, I noticed, were able to achieve this level of dexterity and technical ability. And I noticed that they had their guitars slung a little higher. So it was really out of practicality of, of being able to play uh, with perhaps a little more attention to detail than having the guitar slung all the way down here, which is actually sort of counterproductive for me personally if I want to play with any sort of dexterity, you know. So that's, yeah, as that's you it. lower it, you can feel like the percentage level of your of your technique, like you know, going going low. It's, it's a it's physical like, indicator of that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it certainly. It for most people, it seems that way. Unless you have unusually la big hands, and you can just deal with that angle. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, how do you play? This is again a technical question. How do you play with that kind of technique or at that speed? Shall I say? And everything else on the guitar is quiet. The most difficult thing about the guitar, the muting. How do you achieve that? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I've spent uh, spent a lot of time. It, it's a combination of things for me. You know, I certainly have to be very cautious of the, the muting with my right hand. I, I, with the palm, I, I do a lot of palm muting, but I don't want it to be too strong. I um, I don't unless I particularly want a palm muted part. But um, I spend a lot of time practicing with headphones. I spend a lot of time practicing with the amp in the room. You know, I think both both worlds are important because if I practice only with an amp in physical air, you know, uh, then I noticed something when I was first starting to get to play on recordings uh, when I was a teenager that all of a sudden what happens is that I, I put the headphones on in a studio and I'm like, oh my God, is that what I sound like, you know? And so practicing with, in fact, headphones on running through my little Line 6 gear, uh, which does sound great, you know, um, it, it enables me to sort of focus on things with the, the degree of detail that you would in the studio. So that's a great moment for me to hone in muting and making sure that I don't have resonance coming from open guitar strings, which is unwanted. Um, I think to some extent that will happen a little bit. But um, you've got to do your best in making sure it doesn't. Um, but yeah, I think I, I spend a lot of time with the headphones on trying to iron that out. And I, I don't, I practice again, sometimes with a bit of drive on, oftentimes with 
just a clean sound. Mm. Three non-guitarist composers that your students and your fans need to hear. Keith Jarrett. Keith Jarrett and Keith Jarrett. No, I'll give you two other ones. <laughs> uh, probably um, Keith Jarrett, Joe Zawinul, and um, I will say Wayne Shorter. Three guitarists that your students and your fans should hear. Well, there, there are lots of, lots of legends that, that I think you may already be familiar with, so I'll give you some that you might not necessarily know. Um, there's a wonderful guitar player who lived in New York for a long time, but now is sort of back and forth between uh, New York and um, I think Switzerland and parts of Europe. Uh, his name is Travis Reuter, R-E-U-T-E-R. And Travis is one of my favorite guitarists on earth. Um, incredible player. I played on an album called Wake Up Call um, by David Weiss with him. And I, I was on the whole album, but it was a two guitar affair the whole time with mm. either myself and Travis or myself and Nia Felder. And that was a lot of fun. And um, I, I would say Nia, but there's a good chance you know who Nia is already. But in case you don't know Travis, uh, check him out. And check Nia out too. I mean, he's fantastic as well. Uh, who else? Guitar players. Um, one more, one more. Okay, one more. <laughs> oh, gosh. Starting to... Well, you know, I'm, I'm blanking uh, on younger more up and coming people i'm going to kick myself how about, later. how about a classic how about a classic person and it could be benson it could be holdsworth it could be jeff beck it could be scott henry it doesn't matter who is one of these classic heavies that oh okay then ralph towner people don't listen to ralph towner who are my age why not ralph towner is brilliant he he is uh, one of the greatest musical minds in the history of music and i was very fortunate to meet ralph towner when i was 17 and and hear him play live a few times in Australia and, and hang out with him. And uh, Ralph Towner's music, and even and meeting him and hanging out with him, had a huge impact on my life. And um, uh, got to check out his albums. I'm sure a lot of people right now are like, who? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, I'm serious. So that, that also leads me to ask you about this. Your writing. Mm-hmm. If you liked Ralph Towner, then we we all know about his um, oh his just genius writing, and that that must mean that your writing is probably influenced by him as well. Oh, hugely! He would be one of my as a as a composer in my capacity as a composer. Ralph Towner would be uh, among the top three people, probably. Uh, well, probably top five, you know. Uh, I'd not to demote him at all, but it's just that's <laughs> just to be to be realistic. <laughs> But Ralph yeah. is someone who compositionally is, uh, uh, you know, mastery and brilliance are, are not strong enough words. You know, it's, it's transcendent. I agree, yeah. And now I am going to um, ask you this question that um, probably a lot of people, I'm sure that a lot of uh, guitarists have come across this, and that is how do you balance a relationship and being an artist? That's a great question. And um, I think if you're going to be in a, a serious committed relationship with a person and be an artist, it is, a, it is a balancing act, you know, so as to not neglect one or the other. That is the, the, the art, inherent artistry that you're pursuing or the relationship. And probably the, um, the key element that, that I could possibly impart uh, is to make sure that you are with a person in your life uh, who understands what you're going for and understands your vision from the get-go. Um, if, well said. Yeah, if, if you are not with someone who understands the sort of borderline nomadic nature of your life uh, and sort of the, the very flexible schedule and <laughs> it's very sort of unusual compared to a sort of typical nine to five routine. Uh, if you're not with someone who understands that, then you, you probably will run into trouble. So um, as you know, I'm married and um, I'm very fortunate that my wife, certainly uh, being a creative individual herself, understands my lifestyle. Uh, Lovely. So that, that would be my best advice I could give you. 
And to wrap this up, you have, um, like I said, there's a lot of fans watching and I hope that they made it this far because I really enjoyed this entire thing. <laughs> um, it really was the fastest 50 minutes. And for those of you guys who are watching and girls, we had a nice chat before this too and we'll chat after. He's probably like, oh yeah, no, we're not. <laughs> but um, uh, what is... The what is one quick and as concise as you can make it piece of advice you can give to those aspiring to be like Ben? Um, well, you know, look, just uh, if, if you want to if you want to do anything like what I've gotten to do in my life, just just believe it yourself, believe it and do it and keep going. You're going to make mistakes. We all do. It's, it's life. Yeah, you know, if you make a mistake, you know, beat yourself over, you, over the head for a moment, but then keep going. That's the best advice awesome. I could give. <laughs> now, you, are you taking private students now? Um, you know what? I, I had sort of gotten to a point pre-COVID where my, um, my schedule was such that I wasn't able to, but I have been taking on a few private students because I have more time. And I genuinely enjoy it. I love talking about music. So people can contact you through your website? They can or indeed. Or through your um, IG? Yeah, I probably best to do it through the website. But if you want to contact me through um, Instagram, I'm a bit slower with that sometimes because I, I get a lot of messages on Instagram. But you can certainly contact me there too. Perfect. Well, Ben, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I, did. I really like this. This, this was is... great. Thank, look, thank yeah. you for such such uh, you know well thought out questions. It makes it just <laughs> makes it no really. It makes it just fun. It makes Thanks. it fun. Thanks. I really appreciate it. that. I really appreciate that. And um, you made this very easy. And I really hope that um, your fans really get something out of this, and that people who aren't familiar with you become familiar with you and buy your material and guys it's not that much money i mean it really isn't like you know six bucks and you can get like pdfs that are going to stump you for a good long while and um uh, i'm guessing that if they have any questions about that they can also ask you that through your website and um uh so thanks ben i thank really you. appreciate it thank you for having and, um, me this has been a blast thank you awesome man i'll i'll see you soon hopefully absolutely <laughs> bye take care of yourself take care. bye <laughs>